Hey folks, in this example we're going to deal with the velocity of a rolling wheel. And so let's take a look at this wheel. This is a simple system that we see all the time and we use it a lot in dynamic systems. And in this particular wheel we're just given a radius of r and then the angular speed of omega b. And so if we apply reference frame to this problem we have our inertial reference frame which has our basis vectors e sub 1, e sub 2, and then an e sub 3 pointing directly out of the plane. And then we attach a body frame to the wheel. Basis vectors b, b sub 1, b sub 2, and then a b sub 3 out of the frame. And the frame is attached to a point O prime. Now we want to do two things with this problem. The first thing we want to do is determine all of the constraints that are present in a rolling wheel. And to do that, we need to take a look at the degrees of freedom. We've used our expression for the degrees of freedom. We have m degrees of freedom is equal to 3n, so that's 3 potential degrees of freedom per rigid body, minus k, where k is are the constraint equations. So n equals 1, because we only have one rigid body here. And so if n equals 1, then m is equal to 3 times 1 minus k, which gives us 3 minus k. Now, in the problem statement, we already see that this is a one degree of freedom system. So if it's a one degree of freedom system, that means that we're only, we can give it only one kinematic input, which is our angular speed of the body, and that'll make it roll. We can make it roll to the right or to the left, depending on whether the speed is positive or negative. And so for this to be a one degree of freedom system, that means that k needs to be, we need to find two constraint equations. And so our first constraint, let's observe that the center of the wheel, which we're calling O prime, can only move in the horizontal direction. So if it's a counterclockwise rotation, the center of the wheel will move to the left. If it's a clockwise rotation, the center of, center of the wheel is going to move to the right. And it can only move in the horizontal direction. It can't move in the vertical direction. And we call this a no-bounce condition. And to express the no-bounce condition mathematically, we simply say that the inertial velocity of O prime with respect to O, so this is as observed in the inertial reference frame, to restrict this to only the horizontal direction, then we say that the dot product with E sub 2, which is our vector pointing up, is equal to 0. And so mathematically, this gives us a scalar equation in which we, we can enforce a no-bounce condition, which says that O prime can only move horizontally. Now, after applying the no-bounce condition, we still have two ways in which we can move the wheel to satisfy this constraint. The first way that we could move the wheel is by taking the wheel and sliding it along the ground. So the entire wheel would translate along the ground either to the left or to the right, still keeping this center point level. And this would be a slipping condition. But if we look at our problem, it specifically says that it rolls along the flat surface without slipping. And so if we're not going to allow it to slip, then it can't translate. Instead, it has to roll. So to apply the no-slip condition, this condition states that the point on the wheel that's in contact with the ground, so this would be attached to the wheel that's in contact with the ground, for, to apply the no-slip, it has no instantaneous inertial velocity. So in our diagram, this would indicate that the velocity of point P, if we look on the right-hand right side here, the velocity of point P, which is attached to the wheel, as observed in the inertial reference frame, this is with respect to O, is equal to zero. Now this constraint may catch you off guard for a moment because it's not completely intuitive in how we typically think of wheels because wheels spin. How can a point on a wheel have an instantaneous velocity of zero? So the best way to do that is actually to look at a wheel in motion as it's rolling. We're going to go back about 55 years to a video and this video was created by Professors Patterson Hume and Professor Ivey. 
and it was a 1960s educational film. We've seen this before, um, dealing with reference frames. And this is a section in which we're going to be able to follow that motion of a rolling wheel. So take a look at this and watch it I as it goes. I want you to watch the motion of this white spot. You probably see the spot moving in a circle. But this is what its path is actually like in the Earth frame of reference. This is your normal frame of reference. You saw the spot moving in the circle because your eye moved along with the cart. You put yourself in the frame of reference of the moving cart. So you see, it isn't always true that we view motion from the Earth frame of reference. When the motion is simpler from the moving frame, you automatically put yourself in that moving frame. All right, so there we have it. You see that the motion of that point on the wheel itself is rotating, but it depends on what we're observe, what reference frame we're observing it from. And in this case, we want to observe this from uh, what he called the Earth's frame of reference and what we're calling the, in the inertial reference frame. And so as you follow that white spot, which is on the edge of the circle as it was rolling, it created this shape, which we went down, stopped, came up, went down again and stopped, came up again, and it'll just repeat this pattern over and over as that wheel rolls. And this has a special name, it's called a cycloid. And cycloids are the particular geometric pattern that a point on a wheel creates when it rolls without slipping. Now, what I've drawn here is an ideal cycloid. Just a side note is that the speed of that cart and the speed of that wheel weren't exactly synced, and that's why we had these, these interesting little loops right there. However, when there's no slipping that occurs and it's actually rolling, then when we look at this particular area, then there truly is a point in which it comes down, stops, and then goes back up. The point at which it stops is the point at which it makes contact with the ground. And so let's go back to our constraint. Our no-slip condition, what we said originally is that our no-slip condition is when the velocity of that point, this will be point P, the velocity of the point when it comes in contact with the ground as observed in the inertial reference frame, is equal to zero. And so here we have a change in direction on the cycloid where it hits the ground, comes off the ground, and any time we have a change in direction, the velocity is zero. And so coming back up to our constraints, we've now identified the two constraints that we need. One is a no-bounce condition, and the second is a no-slip condition. And this is the one that's not terribly intuitive but as you begin to deal more and more with rolling and wheels, you'll apply this every time. All right, so now let's find the inertial velocity of point O prime, which is the center of the wheel. We're going to use our velocity equation that we've developed before, and we're going to find the velocity of O prime as observed in the inertial reference frame. And so remember, we need to first start with a velocity of a point on the wheel that we know. And the point on the wheel that we know is actually point P, because we just defined the no-slip condition in which the velocity of point P is zero. So we know the velocity of point P, the inertial velocity, and then we need to add to that the relative velocity, or what we call the rotational velocity. So the velocity of O prime relative to point P, as observed in the inertial reference frame. This takes the same form that we've used before in which we called this the translational component, we called this the rotational component, or the velocity of the point that we know, and then the velocity of the point that we want, which is P, I'm sorry, the point that we want, which is O prime, relative to the point P that we know. And so let's fill in what we know. We know that the velocity of P with respect to point O, as observed in the inertial re reference frame, is zero. We just saw that with the cycloid. And then we're going to add to this the relative velocity, or rotational velocity, which is omega of our body B, as observed in the inertial reference frame, cross.
crossed with, and then it's the position vector of O prime with respect to P. And this is all information that we've seen before um, in the last lesson, and we're just going to apply it. So our angular velocity of rigid body B, as observed in the inertial reference frame, omega B, is equal to omega B, and then it's counterclockwise, and that's in the E3 direction. And our position vector, R of O prime, with respect to P, at this instant in time, is going to be the radius R, and it's in the E2 direction. So this is O prime with respect to P, and so that gives us our E2 direction. We substitute these in, so it's omega B in the E3 direction, crossed with R in the E2 direction, and this gives us negative r omega b in the e1 direction. And that's it. We've now found the velocity of our point O prime, which is the center of the wheel, as observed in the inertial reference frame. And it's the radius of the wheel multiplied times the angular velocity. And we have this here in the negative e1 direction. And this occurs because our angular, our angular speed is counterclockwise. And so if our angular speed is counterclockwise, we would anticipate that our O prime is moving to the left, and the left is in the negative E1 direction. Now notice one other interesting thing about our constraints, is that in our equations here, we only applied what we call the no-slip condition, which was the velocity of point P with respect to O as observed in the inertial reference frame is equal to zero. And when we did that, we ended up with the no bounce condition, which was saying that the velocity of O prime is only in the E1 direction. There's no E2 component here. And this occurred because in our no-slip condition, our no-slip also took care of the E2 direction, which if we're bouncing, you know, we're talking about a wheel that would be going up and down. And so if point P, when it's in contact with the ground, has no velocity in the up or down direction, then it, it's also, what, what is also implied there is a no bounce condition. And so now we've expanded on our initial treatment of this, which of rolling, which was with gears and rotational motion. And with our gears, our points were fixed. O prime was fixed, O double prime was fixed. And now if we release that constraint of it being fixed, we now have rolling, rolling motion with no bounce and a no uh, slip condition in which O prime can translate, but then we also have the rotational motion of the rigid body.